Hello and welcome to the session where we continue the development of our unsteady state material balances both in time and space across our chemical process units and we are focused on finding the concentration as it varies across those variables. And we are doing all this with the understanding that we are moving towards some generalized framework, some deeper understanding which uh, unifies all these case studies and we'll show you eventually that we can model all this with just one equation. For now, we are acquiring experience in these multiple case studies. So in this next question, we are looking at flow through a cylindrical tube, and we are fed by a stream with a concentration C in, and we know uh, that uh, the fluid is initially fully mixed in the radial direction. So we'll unpack a bit just now what that means. We are concerned about variation in the axial direction and uh, that's uh, of course due to convection and diffusion. And so we want to develop both the steady state and the unsteady state concentration profiles. So it doesn't say unsteady here but we will do that anyway. So to start tackling this problem it's always important to start out with the sketch of the system. Right, and of course, in the assessments, we will actually allocate um, some credit for drawing these sketches correctly and accurately and labeling them properly. And you see, with all these problems, it's the understanding of the physical situation that governs how well we are going to answer these questions. So you may spend half an hour doing the wrong development, whereas you could have saved yourself all that time if you spent just f five minutes at the beginning just sketching out a, a decent solution or a decent explanation of the physical situation. And um, as the saying goes, uh, you can save yourself five minutes in the beginning with uh, half an hour of development later on. So don't do that. Start always with a sketch that corresponds to the description. So let's look at the description again. So it's a cylindrical tube, so of course uh, that's what we have. Uh, and we can start labeling a couple of things. Uh, we can choose Z to be the direction down the tube, and we can label AC to be the uh, cross-sectional area of that tube. So we are assuming that it's, um, it's a regular tube, so the cross-sectional area stays the same. And by the way, I just drew this picture in perspective. So um, it is the same cross-sectional, it is the same area, uh, it, it is the same um, radius uh, in, at both ends. It's just, I drew it that way just so um, it's a little bit more expressive in this drawing. Um, so we've labeled uh, Z to be the axial direction and uh, we've labeled the cross-sectional area. We are also told that we are fed by a stream with a concentration CA in. So arriving at this point is CA in here. Okay, and then we know also in the problem it says it's uh, fully mixed in the radial direction. So we are expecting the concentration to vary down the tube in this direction, but uh, this comment about radial uh, perfect mixing means that there's no concentration change. Uh, so if you look on this uh, lightly colored disc here, this is of course a cross section through the tube. So if we are looking along the radius here, there's no change in the concentration in this direction. So that's basically telling us the change is only in the Z direction like so. Right, so that's one of the simpler pictures that uh, we may draw. Um, you'll, you'd be surprised how quickly these pictures become more complex. And in fact, in the next question that we look at, it's, it's really an expansion on the same picture. So you'll see very quickly the simple picture becomes much more complicated. But anyway, uh, let's continue with this. So if we know the variation is only in this direction Z, then we can think about creating a control volume that is some small partition in Z. And this is a general principle, right? Because you may have been wondering by now, how have we been choosing um, these spaces? So when we say we are going to write a little mass balance over a particular space, how are we choosing that space? And to answer that, you think about in which directions the concentration might be varying or whatever variable it is. 
in which direction is that variable changing. So in this case, concentration is only varying in the z direction. If, was, if it was varying in the r direction as well, then we have to consider a small change delta r. And in fact, that's what we'll do in the next question. But for now, for this problem, our concentration is only varying in z. So we consider some position z and some small change in z. And if you look at what happens then, right, and this is the important part in the drawing, right, the rest of it is your macro picture, but the important part is to identify the control volume over which we'll be writing our balance. So we pick a specific axial position z, and then you can draw the, the disk that occurs at that position z. So choosing some position z down there specifies a particular cross section down the tube. And then if you look at some position slightly to the right of that by an amount delta z, then you have uh, another cross section there. So that's the space over which we want to write our material balance. And we typically start with identifying the number of moles in that sub volume. And here again, we are calling uh, the number of moles in that specific sub volume delta Na. And of course, we can define the concentration there to be Ca. And we should be a bit more explicit. We should say Ca at position Z. So that's the concentration there. And uh, so that's, of course, taken at the left edge of the space. But uh, if delta Z is small enough, we can take Ca as a good indicator of the concentration in, in that whole subvolume. So that's the concentration. And then, of course, the volume of the space is the cross-sectional area, which is the flat face area there. So AC multiplied by the width there, delta Z. So that's telling us the number of moles in the space. So if you like, um, I'm not trying to say there's a recipe to doing this, but um, a useful approach. Number one, draw your sketch. Number two, um, go ahead and think about how you count up the number of moles in the subvolume. Well, identify the subvolume and then uh, figure out the number of moles in that subvolume. And an important part of that is figuring out the volume of that space. So AC delta Z is the volume. You can also think about the areas of that space. So we've identified one obvious area, the uh, AC as it's labeled here, that's the area there as well. You could also talk about the area on the outside rim of this, um, well, not just the rim, on this outside surface, on this curved surface here. So that's another area that we could think about. And in this case, you can't have flow through that curved surface, right? You can see here, you may have diffusion in this direction, but you aren't having radial diffusion through, um, through that curved surface. That's part of the reason why we don't consider concentration changes in that direction either. So the relevant area for us is this cross-sectional area here. And so when you start thinking about those areas, of course, the next step is to start thinking about the fluxes. So we've talked about the number of moles. Now let's look at the fluxes through the space. So the fluxes are going to be the things which tend to change the number of moles in the space. And of course, we know, generally speaking, that the flux is your diffusion flux plus your convection flux. And um, again, this is the simplified version of uh, the overall balance. We know that we typically write this as Xa times Na plus Nb, but uh, we are going to say that an, uh, a reasonable approximation is given by this here. All right, so this is the Na, we're saying Nb equals zero in effect, and uh, we established that upfront before starting any of this development. Okay, so this is generally speaking the flux at any position z. So if you pick any position z, it doesn't have to be in the subvolume, any position z, then at that position z, the total flux through uh, that, that position will be the sum of the diffusion flux and the convection flux. So we are accepting here that if there is a flow rate in here, if we are fed by some stream here, and if that stream is passing through the pipeline, then we can identify a certain velocity that's moving through that pipeline. Now, it may occur to us that there may be variations in the radial direction in terms of U. We know there are no variations in terms of concentration. We are told it's perfectly mixed. 
um, and, and so we aren't interested in changes in concentration in the radial direction. However, for example, if you think of laminar flow, then your velocity uh, may be varying in the R direction. Um, but in this case, we are just treating U as, uh, as a fixed number in R. So, um, so it's as simple as we see here. So that's it. That's the flux that fully describes the changes across the space there. And you see, I've spent a fair amount of time just talking about these three elements. Because what we'll see next is that once we have this in place, the rest is kind of mechanical. The rest follows fairly easily after this, right? Because obviously the next step is then to consider the rate of change of the moles of A in the subvolume. And so we write DDT delta NA. And so the number of moles in that subvolume is changing due to the flux into that volume here minus the flux out of that volume there. And so we've identified generally what the flux is. So we can say the flux into that subvolume is Na at Z, and then to convert it to a moles per second, we multiply by the cross-sectional area or the area normal to that flux. So that's the molar flow rate into that subvolume. And then, of course, uh, by analogy, the flow rate out of the subvolume is the flux at Z plus delta Z, the rightmost edge of that subvolume, and then that's multiplied by cross-sectional area. So that's our balance. Of course, this is more symbolic. We, it's, uh, it's not actually an equation we can integrate at the moment. Um, it's, it's more descriptive or symbolic. It's important to have this here so that you know the basis of what, what's to follow. So now we can go ahead and substitute. Um, so we know delta Na is Ca of Z, Ac delta Z. So Ac and delta Z, those are not Z functions, only Ca is a Z function. So we can take Ac delta Z out of the uh, derivative here. Um, well, uh, and in fact, the point is that they are not changing in time. The Z doesn't matter. Um, yes, they are not functions of Z, but uh, the point is uh, they are not changing in time either. So we take those out as constant and we're left with DDT of CA and then the rest of it uh, is, is as it is. Um, and now if we just look at this, um, you can see AC is a common factor everywhere. So we can divide through by AC that cancels out and then we can divide by delta Z. And if you look at this, um, you can see here there's a certain function at Z plus delta Z minus the same function evaluated at z and all that is divided by delta z. So clearly if we take the limit delta z going to zero, this is going to be ddz of na. And uh, here you can see z plus delta z is in this position with a minus sign in front. So this is actually minus dna dz. Right, so that's, uh, that's the balance so far. Now, of course, we would like to collapse this equation to a single variable in CA or, or in NA for that matter, but uh, CA we'll find is easier because if we look at NA, um, the expression for NA is all in terms of CA. So if we substitute for NA in here, then um, we've got DDZ of this, which is going to be minus DAE D2CA DZ squared, and then we'll have DDZ of UCA. So we know that the velocity, uh, or if we are assuming that the velocity is the same as we look down the tube, then du dv, uh, sorry, du dz is zero. And so we don't have to uh, consider this um, as another derivative. We can accept this as a constant with respect to z. So it's a constant of this differentiation. And so we can simply differentiate um, Na with respect to Z as uh, DC DZ. So that's the balance that we have uh, by the end of the day. Right, so this fully describes the situation where we have um, a variation only in the Z direction and it's a cylindrical tube. And in fact, you can see here that uh, the fact that it's cylindrical hasn't featured at all, right? You don't see any uh, R type variables here. You'll get the same balance if this was a, a channel, for example. So um, that's just something to observe. Uh, and in fact, the reason for that is we don't have anything changing in the radial direction. So that's why um, we don't see any uh, R type variables. 
Um, so this is an equation of differences, right? A differential equation. Uh, well, yeah, the differential actually means the small changes, the, the little differential elements. But it's also an equation of differences, of changes. So it's telling us the change in time is related to the gradients in space. So that's how we read uh, this partial differential equation. And now to solve this, of course, uh, this is just telling us how things change. We want to nail down a solution. That means we have to specify some boundary conditions. And here we see we have uh, two independent variables. It's first order in T and second order in Z because of this term, not because there are two terms. It's, uh, there's a second order derivative here. So it's three boundary conditions that we need, one of which will be um, the initial condition. So here's the initial condition. We are stating simply that we know the concentration as a function of z um, initially. That is, at, time, at t equals 0, we simply know uh, the concentration everywhere in, in that tube. So we know how concentration was varying across the tube. And in fact, I think in uh, the numerical simulation, I just assume it's a constant number through there. Then um, we are fed by a stream. So we had seen this one before in the previous example. Um, but that case didn't have a flowing stream. That case was uh, two compartments and uh, there was no flow. Now we have a flow, which by the way, uh, means we have this extra term now, right? That's how, uh, that's what's different now. Before we just had that term, now we've got a flow term. And now also because we are fed by a specific stream in here with a specific concentration CA in, then we can assume that the concentration as it just enters the tube is identical to the concentration in the feed stream. So just to the right of the inlet point, we can say that uh, the concentration just inside, right, at z equals zero, just inside the tube, that concentration must be the same as the inlet concentration. So this is a nice boundary condition that we have now, right? And then we need one more boundary condition. Remember we said we need, we need three, we've got two so far. And another boundary condition we'll use is that by the time we reach the end, that there's, uh, there might be some gradient. So the concentration, there might be some gradient by the end, maybe it's sloping upwards but just inside and just outside, it should have the same slope. So we can imagine the slope is changing as we look down the tube, but just at the exit point, nothing new is going to happen outside of the tube. So let's just assume the slope here. So dc dz here is equal to dc dz there. Um, so those two values are equal. That means d2c dz squared is equal to zero. So we take this as our uh, exit boundary condition. So we specify it's at the exit. This only applies at position L. Um, so that's our third boundary condition. Right now, we want to develop the steady state version of, this, um, of the solution. Now, we can think about what we expect to see uh, right off the bat, right? Um, so we know we are going to do uh, all kinds of derivation and we will uh, rigorously determine what it's going to be. But can we imagine um, just at the outset, and, and it's important always to do this, right? Take a step back from the question, what do we expect to see as our solution? So we are feeding component A in here and the concentration is going to change in here due to A coming in. So A is going to diffuse in and it's also convecting in. And so it's going to displace the concentration that was in here. So we had some other concentration in the tube initially, CA naught, and now we are displacing it with CA in. And we are interested in steady state now. So we anticipate at steady state, by the time we reach steady state, all the original fluid that was in the tube will have been displaced and we will only have concentration CA in throughout the tube after that. So if you think about it, we don't have anything else that's changing concentration here. Um, the question said nothing about a reaction that's consuming A or that A is leaving through some through the walls or anything like that. A is just, uh, is just flowing through the system. So um, to us, it looks pretty obvious. The concentration here is going to be CA in throughout this tube. 
And so along with your initial sketch, it's also always useful to just uh, sketch out uh, what you think the graph is going to look like and say, I think at steady state, this is going to happen. So a couple of small sketches there will help tremendously in terms of uh, developing the, the rest of the problem. Right, so um, to to find the steady state solution, let's let, so let's do it rigorously uh, now instead of kind of intuitively. So if we want steady state, then of course um, we uh, we say at steady state the gradients the, the time gradients will have died out. So uh, we set a zero here, leaving us with the rest of this equation. So uh, we can write it like this, and then that's a second order ODE. And the way we solve um, second order ODEs is simply by uh, substituting some new variables. So let C1 be CA and let C2 be uh, DC1 DZ. That also means then obviously that it's equal to DCA DZ, right? So that's C1 and C2. And if you look at this, um, that also means that DC2 dz equals, and if you look at this, a c2 is this, so d, ddz of c2 is going to be d2ca dz squared. Right, so you get your second order uh, uh, term like this, and now it's in terms of a first order uh, derivative of, uh, of a different variable. Okay, so um, we can rewrite our first term here as DAE DC2 uh, DZ minus and then here uh, DCA DZ we can rewrite that instead as a, a C2 so U times C2. Okay so now we have uh, the equation in a first order form and uh, clearly we, we can rewrite this in the standard uh, first order form like this. And so you can integrate this equation quite easily using your, um, your usual exponential function. So this is actually an exponential rise um, in concentration as a function of z. Well, uh, this is not concentration, by the way. This is um, the gradient of concentration. So what we found is that the gradient changes exponentially um, in this problem, at steady state at least. Right, so anyway, um, we have this, but this is not good enough because um, in the real world, what we really deal with is CA. So we need to find C1, not C2. Um, so with the C2 now, we can uh, realize that, well, we have from the definition also, right? We had defined uh, C2 to be uh, the first derivative of C1. So we can say DC1 DZ equals C2. And C2 is simply this thing, so we've brought that down there. And then we can simply integrate this. So you can integrate this function with respect to z. And here you've got the exponential of a coefficient times the variable. So we take out a factor of 1 over that uh, factor. So we're going to have uh, C2 naught uh, DAE over U times x of the same function. And so we've uh, integrated this, and then you could say there's a hidden plus zero here, which we can integrate to a k1. Okay, so that's uh, our solution. But you can see that we have uh, two unspecified values. So there's this unknown k1, so that's just the constant that came from integrating the zero. And then you've also got the c2 naught. And it's tempting to say, well, that's just an initial condition. But you see, it's not really, because C2 itself is a bit of a weird variable. C2 is, is actually the gradient of concentration. So we, we don't know quite what to make of this uh, C2 naught. So we'll just say simply, we regard this as there being two unknown constants. Everything else is nice and defined. We know C2 is the same as CA, so um, this part is easy. So C A as a function of Z, that's the thing we are looking for. That's the same as C1. Um, D A E U and Z, those are all nice variables. We know what those are. So the only weird parts are C2, O and, uh, and K1. So of course, to get rid of these unknowns, all we have to do is apply our boundary conditions. And uh, the first boundary condition is that the concentration at the inlet point is the 
uh, concentration in the inlet stream. So we can say CA at Z equals zero is equal to C1 at Z equals zero, and uh, that's equal to CA in. And then if you look at the equation here, when uh, Z equals zero, um, we get X of zero, and X of zero is a one. So this whole thing becomes uh, C2O DAE over U, right? And then times one, basically, and then plus K1. And then we said uh, C1 at Z equals naught uh, equals CA in. So we can say uh, that C1 is CA in over here. Right, so that's one relationship. Um, we didn't get rid of any constants, but uh, we have a relationship at least between these two constants now. Um, and yeah, we, we can just rewrite it slightly uh, differently. Um, now let's think about the boundary on the other side. So at position Z equals L, we said that the second gradient of concentration equals zero. Um, so in other words, there's no change in the gradient. So we accept that there's a non-zero gradient DC, DZ, but that gradient is the same just on the inside and just on the outside at the exit point. So D2CA DZ squared equals zero. And of course, we recognize D2CA DZ squared as DC2 DZ. And so we are going to uh, go over to our solution D, uh, for C2. So we have C2 as a function of Z here. And we can just go ahead and differentiate this function. So if we want DC2 DZ. And uh, when you differentiate the exponential, the coefficient here um, becomes a factor out there times the same function. So we expect we're going to get C2 naught uh, times U over DAE times X of the same stuff. And that's what we see here, right? So that's just differentiating on the inside. And then of course we have to apply that Z equals L. So the X of this here, um, we replace Z by L here. And, um, and of course here, um, yeah, uh, sorry, this is pre-differentiation. Uh, so we differentiate, this is the function that we differentiate, and then we get the factor out U DAE, and then we apply Z equals L, and so the L comes in there, and that's our function. So that's just if we differentiate it, and then if we apply the boundary condition, then that second derivative equals zero. So this whole thing equals zero. And if you look here, everything is constant. Uh, these are all positive constants. Well, uh, these ones we know, velocity and diffusivity are positive constants. The length is a positive constant. So all this um, is a positive constant. And the only unknown is this, and all this equals zero. So the only way for this to be zero is if uh, C2 naught is zero, right? So that's, um, we've now found our value for that uh, unknown constant C2O. And if we go back um, to the solution that we want, right, the solution we want is, is actually CA or C1. So if we apply uh, C2 naught equals zero, this whole thing here is going to vanish, right? So that's a big zero. And then for K1, let's look at K1. We found from the first boundary condition, K1 looks like this. And then again, we've got the C2 zero, which we know is zero. So we have nothing but CA in, K1 equals CA in. That means C1 equals CA in, right? So that tells us at steady state, our concentration is the same as the inlet value. And so when we took a step back and we said, that's what we expect to see, we've now rigorously proven that that's what we get. And you might say, well, why did we have to go and do so much work? Surely we could have just used our intelligence and, and, and said it's going to be CA in everywhere eventually. So yes, uh, that, that's the more efficient way to do it. Um, but what's nice is we, we got a bit of experience in deriving these equations, but also now we are in a position, now that we've done all this development, we are in a position to think about the unsteady state case. And it may well be the case that we are interested in knowing how long it's going to take uh, for this uh, for this stream to replace all the fluid here. How long is it going to take for CA naught to become CA in? And you see that might not be so easy to figure out. And that's because uh, 
uh, well, number one, you could say, well, I can figure it out very easily. If I know the volumetric flow rate here, and if I know the volume, then clearly the volume divided by the volumetric flow rate is the time taken for this uh, fluid to completely fill this tube. So that's true, but in our case, we also have diffusion. And you see, if uh, A is diffusing in ahead of the bulk movement of the fluid, then this tube could fill up and reach CA in even faster than convection alone is going to do it. So you might get uh, CA in accomplished in here sooner than the time from just convection. And so let's see if we can figure uh, out how long it's going to take to do that. So we need to return to the unsteady state case. That means we, uh, we bring back our gradient in time uh, term. And then, of course, we had the initial condition, and then we had the inlet condition as well. And, uh, and so we also still have the fact that the gradient is constant at the exit point. So we've got the same boundary conditions as before and the same unsteady state balance. And we want to go ahead and solve that equation. And um, I've, uh, I've shown in, in the same set of notes how you can discretize these equations. So of course, this is an equation written in terms of differences and gradients. So it's telling you how the gradient in, in one dimension is related to the gradients in the other dimensions. That's the way to read that. And then uh, in that section on numerical methods, it shows you how you can discretize these and convert them into a form that can then be simulated, right? Because uh, a numerical solver can't deal with a symbolic expression like this. It needs to be converted to a bunch of numbers. And simply put, the way um, it, it does this is uh, we create a vector of numbers here. So of course, um, according to our uh, symbolic view this is a continuum of numbers um, but if we take discrete values if we take maybe z equals zero z equals one millimeter two millimeters and and so on um, then we we would have a, a discrete set of uh, numbers here and then we would solve the balances over those so anyway in the numerical uh, part of this course we'll talk about that in a bit more detail but for right now, uh, that's basically the approach that's taken here. And in fact, if you look at this code, it's, it's, uh, all the action is here. And it's, it's, quite, it's just a few lines of code for solving what looks like a, a fairly uh, scary looking e equation. So um, we solve that here. And then let's just look at the solution. So this uh, is showing us the concentration. So that's on the y axis. And then this is the axial position. So we are looking at z equals zero going over to, um, this is just one centimeter. So let's look at the numbers we used. So we used a uh, diffusivity of 10 to the minus six, a length of just one centimeter. So it's a one centimeter tube, um, if you can call that a tube. Um, and then we are saying that the inlet stream is at a concentration of 20 and the initial concentration in the tube was 18. And then we also have a, a very slow fluid. It's uh, one centimeter per second, um, right? And in fact, uh, then you can say, well, in one second, uh, it's going to fill up the tube. Um, and then uh, we are considering over two seconds uh, what's happening. So we are taking 20 points in time and 300 points uh, in Z and uh, we solve the problem. So we'll talk about all this in more detail uh, another time when we look at numericals. Anyway, for now, um, we said we start out at 18 everywhere. So this blue line is the situation at t equals zero. So just ignore these other lines for now. So at t equals zero, we had 18, a concentration of 18 at all points in the tube, excepting at the inlet point. At the inlet point, we have the entering fluid is just arriving there, so it must be at 20. So at one point, it's 20. Everywhere else, it's at 18. And then some time passes. Um, so let's say we take um, one microsecond later, right? Then the blue line no longer exists. Now we are on this kind of mustardy color here. And in that short space of time, a little uh, fluid has entered. So at the top here, um, in, instead of falling uh, straight down to this uh, 18, 
uh, it's shifted now slightly in so the entering fluid has slightly entered here and it's reached a value there so that's entering fluid however um, before that uh, we also have had component A simply diffusing into uh, the rest of the tube so this part of the curve is purely due to diffusion this is uh, the only piece that's diffused in this uh, here has just diffused in and the diffusion rate was initially fairly high that's because we have such a sharp gradient so even though these concentration differences are, are fairly small um, they are happening over such a tiny space here that that's quite a, a high diffusion flux in so the diffusion flux is high-ish and so uh, we've got diffusion in there and then there's a little bit of convection that's just started up and then of course as we consider later times then you've got more convection into that um, tube and then uh, you have even more diffusion so component A has diffused in um, and it's diffused into um, regions further down the tube as well so eventually we reach uh, the um, a, a complete CA in saturation uh, much sooner than the one second um, that we uh, that that it would take by convection alone right so that's uh, how we read these graphs right when uh, you want to plot out the solution always try to anticipate what the solution is going to look like um, so we we can see there's going to be diffusion into the tube and there's also going to be a convection influence um, and we uh, we can start out saying okay at t equals zero i know my concentration so draw that line first and then think about these other terms as modifying that line so you can say well um, at the inlet point uh, right at the extreme end it's not going to be this value it's going to be this value so you'll say for this first line it was this value everywhere and then right at the inlet point it's actually this value and then think about okay I can see uh, that diffusion is present here and I can see a, a large gradient here therefore there must be a lot of diffusion into the rest of the tube so the concentration out here is going to rise so it's going to move up from this uh, 18 and and we're going to get something like that there and then we can see also some convection is going to happen so for a short time um, there will be uh, the concentration at the inlet is going to start appearing here and then as time goes on more of it is going to come through so that uh, little description was just uh, the way that we uh, can guess our way around a solution so it's important to do that to try to anticipate what the solution is going to look like and then also when we get the a result like this um, other than saying oh it looks like a swizzle stick or something like that uh, we can also say um, we understand why the curves are sloping as they are all right that's it for this case study i'll see you in the next one